is, as it says about rhetoric, the rhetoric of visual communication. And therefore, we have to start all over again because you know from all <coughs> films, TV shows, sitcoms, and so on, the moment the host or the speaker enters, or the politician enters the stage, there's a loud applause. So for the video, I'll just walk up there and come back and, come back, and then you're all applause as if you're happy to be here, okay? <laughs> Professes her love yep. and is rejected by the gentleman. Yes. And then someone else was listening. Yep. And okay, good. And um, what else? Do we know anything about Hill? <laughs> um, time period? Where does it take place? Uh, sort of. It's not, it's not in the future, no. it's not Second World War. <laughs> in the middle of the 1900s? Yeah, so, and, uh, and their clothes? Are they working clothes? No, 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 no. Uh, upper, oh. upper middle class. I yes, think. and the interior of the room? Oh, very Victorian, I think. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank you, thank you. Now, how many times did they cut in what you've just seen? How many camera movements are there? Camera movements, that could be traveling, panning, tilting, zooming in, zooming out, changing depth of field, all of that. Any time that the camera moves or the frame moves with respect to the object. Hmm. Usually when I ask these questions, they've only seen one or two camera movements. What sounds do we hear besides their dialogue? An orchestra. An orchestra, yes. Where's the orchestra? They sit next door because they're having a ball. No, it's added to the it's film script. Right. It's and there's a sound of a door. Yes, yeah, there's a door slamming, yes, and uh, the vase, yes. The, the music. The slap. Yeah, it is. yes, okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to show it to you again because I really love this scene. Now, I want all the women to, every time there is a cut now, to yell cut really loud, really loud, right? And uh, could, could we have a... Uh, um, I don't, could, would, you, would you count the number of cuts? Yes. Yes? And then I want all the men, or those who identify themselves as men, to say, move. Every time there's a camera movement, right? Yes, we'll ruin this scene completely. So really loud, but taking a lot of air because some of the camera movements might be very long. You might have to inhale once again. Paul, will, will you uh, count the number of times we say move? Ha <laughs> ha 
very tactful word. So, how many cuts? I'm counting. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Hmm. Okay. And moves. Oh. Uh, about fifteen. Fifteen. Yes, I think that's fairly correct. It comes out a little differently each time I count them myself, and then other people count them. But that that doesn't matter. So we're not here to do quantitative research. No, this is qualitative. So why do they make all of these cuts? Is it because these actors were so poor they could only memorize one line at a time? No. Um, uh, uh, Amy? Yeah. Uh, I think it's what, what they cut, for example, over the shoulder. It's to indicate who's speaking, and sometimes it also focuses on, on her when he's speaking. And I think that's because they're interested in the effect of what she's, he's saying to her. So it's more like perspective, like about who's talking at this point. Yes. It's the camera movements and it's the cuts and the vertical montage. You can't do that if you're writing a novel. You can do something that a little similar, but it's not the same. You can't do all of this in a theater. In a theater, usually, even though you experiment with it, and this would know about that, uh, you're usually sitting in one place and the action is up here, and you can't all of a sudden jump around and come close to the actors, that would be very disturbing if you all moved your places. But with film, the camera can all of a sudden move up closer and take us to different places. So, wonderful. We have a lot of things that we can do. We can tell a lot of things in this way. Camera movements could talk a long time about that. Actually, it's doing more than what we would expect. It's not only adding to the dynamics of it, but it's also pointing out things. You notice when she was picking up with us, the camera foreshadowed that. It tilted downwards to show us the vase before she looked down and picked it up. So they knew the script. They knew she was going to do that, and they helped the viewer to understand that that piece of action by foreshadowing it. Okay. Now, There's a famous book about documentary film saying that it's called the uh, representation of reality. But that is the line of thought that really haunts us in film theory. Thinking that film is basically a copy of something out there. I changed the perspective to that of rhetoric saying, no, film is always someone trying to do something persuade or to argue or to stir emotions, create something, just like a speaker. A speaker usually does not stand up to make a copy of the world, but in order to change something in the world, right? We should think about film in the same way, and that might seem a little odd with fiction film, but when it comes to documentary and when it comes to YouTube videos, and other videos that I'll show you of politicians, then all of a sudden it becomes interesting to notice what are they trying to do by means of the camera. Not what are the people in the scene doing, but what are the what is the camera doing? Let's go to another famous classic. I'll show this only once because it's really not. Uh, but uh, it could be nice for the hot. Today. <laughs> so um, I'll see if I can find it. I think we saw it in class just a little while ago. Therefore, I'll ask some questions about this afterwards. Because this is a famous scene, but there are at least five flaws in it from a cinematographic point of view. And uh, we can point them out afterwards. So pay attention.
microphone is the music starting before she's actually turned around. Very good. You don't see any <coughs> cut or like. No, no, we, we don't see any wounds. No. no. Yeah. Today they would have made that, I think, with some heavy makeup. But there's a slight. There's also a jump. There's a there's a moment where we are looking at the shower head Very good and then it jumps uh, yeah. But, but they're with me here today in order to help me. And I hope that at the end of my lecture, actually this is a competition, uh, there's a, an award for the one who can guess correctly their names. Okay, they have names. And I will mention their name along this uh, lecture somehow, maybe. So, just to help you along a little bit, okay. So, with film video, we do not have to have an actual event there, we can create it. So don't talk about representing reality. Talk about what are they trying to do to us. The one thing that I really, really find amazing about this scene is the very end of it, when the woman is dead, the killer leaves the scene, and we're alone yep. in the room, with a dead person, and that the creepiness of that feeling, as, as you were saying, the rhetorical, the, the, the director putting us in the room as the camera person, alone, with a dead body. This is the part where I really get chills in that scene, and I think it's an amazing trick to do, like put us into the film. I think Hitchcock is, is, is brilliant. Yes, very good, very good at this. And that's actually what the film can do, and photographs can do to some extent too. And right now, today, we actually do get a lot of awful pictures of dead people and it's important how they are being filmed if they are to have an impact on us. Right? <coughs> Colin Powell and his team, they rehearsed this. They found a room similar to that of the Security Council. They found furniture like that in that room and they rehearsed how they would be sitting behind him to make it look really believable. And these are the people from the, the central intelligence agencies and so on, uh, responsible for the thick uh, intelligence files, uh, supposedly showing weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And they rehearsed that. And they had their own camera crew filming him right head on to make it be impressive. And Colin Powell later said that when he presented that speech with a lot of evidence for the, these weapons of mass destruction, the invasion had already been decided, so his job was just to present it to make it look credible and reasonable to have the invasion. And that's what I tried to do, he said. Uh, then later, unfortunately, found out there were some flaws in the intelligence. Now, no weapons of mass destruction, but then uh, but he was uh, in good faith just trying to do his job, he said. Yes, they always say that afterwards. Here he shows a little pile, a little class, saying that if this was anthrax, in the ancient meat on bacteria, then it could kill thousands and thousands and thousands. Is it visual proof that there are these anthrax? bacteria in Iraq? Well, it's, mm, we think afterwards we have seen it because he has shown it. That's a rhetorical trick. Make an illustrative example. Use other senses. Use other things than just words. Show it. Air photos. It could be from, uh, well, it could be from Gaza. I'll come back to that. He said it, it's hard for the average person to interpret, but oh, luckily he had colleagues who had spent years and years looking 
had aerial photos and they could interpret it and say quite clearly that this was where they stored, this was one of the places where they stored chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction. And he even showed a picture of a, mobile, a truck that was a mobile laboratory for, for these uh, dangerous stuff. And, and people around the world were convinced. I mean, it's not even disguised as a photograph. It's a graphic illustration. But because of the ethos buildup of Colin Powell, it was generally believed that there was such a thing. City and you get the impression that it's night and there's light on it, so there's action actually. Yep. He's a man of action. Yes. Otherwise, when you look at the other one, you see telephones and you see all those, uh, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the flag, the national identity here is Russia. Yep. So, the one is more modern. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know what those uh, uh, white things there next to Putin, that was telephones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, 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 uh, yes. Did you just mean something you would send to a friend? Yeah, but like something you would send to a friend. It's made like a selfie. Right. He has the camera in his hand. It's less professional, but yeah. at the same time, it seems like closer. Very good. Very good. Yes. You mean? He's also moving the camera to showcase each person behind him. <coughs> yeah. yeah. I remember discussing in a class as well. It's a response video actually mm. to, I believe, someone in Russia claiming that he, him and he, his dad, he was there. there. Yes. Yes. So it was. He took a photo intentionally in the streets of Kiev yeah. with him, his entire staff. Well, I'm not sure if it's Kiev, but it's, yeah. And in, in terms of, of rhetoric, the main shamans, you can say that Putin is talking about the past justifying himself. It's like he's in a courtroom. Whereas uh, Zelensky is talking about the present. Now, I am here now, we are in this situation now. And so he is, he is doing a different type of speech. It is an epithetic uh, type of speech. Okay. Very good. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Today, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't read my news. I, I, I watch my news. Even those where there's a lot of words, I usually just scroll down to different pictures, and if I find an interesting picture, I might look more for it. And look if there's not a video. But we get most of our information from pictures, Still pictures, photos, and live ones. Here are two different ones. And uh, it seems like from this maybe that Zelensky is a nice guy. You can, he'll take you for a ride. Whereas Putin, it's hard to approach him, right? <laughs> uh, it's hard to get close to him. But uh, maybe not so. Putin, uh, Putin is a nice fellow. He's got more facets to him than when I dived into it a little bit, I thought that he, he's, this guy's got many talents. Now, now this. I found this on YouTube.
some of the clever students in our class, they had with a test, they had something about what you can do with AI. And I just wanted to share with you this, that, that they found out that actually has been there at Woodstock. I, I, I'm looking for myself, I think, I think it's me over there. I think it's been cut a little bit, so I should have been there too, but uh, please put me in next time, right? Okay. So it's got all the credibility because it's obviously very important. It's sort of repeating itself, referring to itself, presented by this guy with very high ethos. They found a toilet close by. There's a film with Matt Demon about the invasion of Iraq, where he's trying to find the weapons of mass destruction after the invasion. And Matt Demon at one point claims that we haven't found anything but pigeon shit and some toilets where there should be weapons of mass destruction. I think this guy, Hagari, he's got confused about it. He's seen too much Hollywood. He thinks a toilet is proof that they're terrorists, right? They found a gun and they showed it. And when a BBC crew passed the same place to see all of these smoking guns that they found, there were in the same place two collapsed. So, two smoking guns, better than one, right? And here's, it's stated at the beginning of the film that this is a one-shot video. One shot, no editing of all the evidence, blah, blah, blah. And I looked through it, and I've seen a lot of shit movies in my time, including those I've made myself, and I know where there is a cut. And this was so obvious that I, I can't believe that they think they can get away with it. Look at the white wall. You can see the shadow of the photographer, right? On the lower frame, not on the other one. So there's a lot that's happened between those two shots. And why do they have the light behind the camera? Why do they not use a camera with light on it? They had several cameras down there, I saw it, because they showed that when they pan around. You could have taken a clearer picture with your telephone putting on the light, but then it would not look as gloomy as it does on this video. And that is an effect of the video. It should not be too bright, not be too clear, even a little hand shaking, hand held. Oh, there's a walk away on. Terrorists might be looking around the corner. It's okay to make a video and make a cut, but then you don't try to pull it off by saying, it's a one shot, no cuts, no reason. <coughs> because we are some people who like to look at videos and find faults in it. There's another photo. It's old. It's from 1993, I kind of like it, even though it's fake, both of the boys are Jewish, but still, it's a good photo. That's a good <coughs> story. It was a Canadian magazine who hired a photographer to take this photo, and she found two Jewish boys, and uh, one dressed up like, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, like a Palestinian. So nice. So you can, you can lie with pictures, yes, or you can express hope with pictures. 
That's okay. Film images, it's rhetoric. So it's what you want with your rhetoric, right? Yeah, I wanted students to make a video. We could use our, our good equipment. So I wanted them to make a video just using a normal dumb phone like this and editing it on free software. And I say, why don't you do uh, the shower scene of Psycho with the telephone? They did other things, so I had to do that myself. <laughs> and my wife said, you should have cleaned the bathroom before you filmed it. <laughs> and my son said, it's way too long. But it's shorter than what he took here. I don't get it. 
getting close. It's getting warmer. Let's think about rhetoric. Uh, ethos. What? Ethos. Ethos. Which one of them is ethos? Oh. Uh, <laughs> which one looks the most trustworthy? I mean, rabbit. The rabbit. <laughs> you you wouldn't trust this girl, would you? No. Who couldn't trust that? Is, I mean, a teddy bear. That's the image of trust, right? Confidence. This guy. That is Ethos. Now. Pathos. The rabbit is Pathos. <laughs> the ice is melting. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's Pathos. That's Pathos because it's so. We all need to feel with the polar bears, right? Too bad. The ice is melting. Yeah. But this. Why is this Logos? Well, it's because, of course, it's dressed up in nice clothes. It even had a tie once. And it has its ears out and its eyes wide open, and it's just observing, right? But it doesn't understand anything. It's just observing, right? So that's Logos. That's all the facts. Confidence, trust. That's Pathos, emotion. Right? So. And um, who was it who, who guessed it first, the, the Itzos? That was you, Ayo? Then I have a special yeah. present for you. That's your award. Thank you. Know. you.